The conflicts in the Red Sea and Black Sea carry a number of important lessons which might inform the Royal Navy's efforts to generate its future fleet. As the Royal Navy proceeds with its recapitalization program, what lessons can it draw regarding future threats from the conflicts in the Red Sea and Black Sea? Over the last two years, warfare at sea has been conducted at a higher level of intensity than has been seen for decades. The conflict in Ukraine in which the Russian Black Sea Fleet was rendered functionally inactive by country without a surface fleet. And the ongoing battle in the Red Sea have provided analysts and practitioners of naval warfare with a wealth of empirical evidence. It is thus germane to consider what lessons the Royal Navy might draw from these conflicts as the force continues a process of recapitalization which will extend into the 2030s. The remarkable success enjoyed by an overmatched Ukrainian Navy and the country's security service against Russia's Black Sea Fleet has, understandably, led some to ponder the question of whether we are approaching a tipping point in the conduct of warfare at sea. The ability of the Ukrainians to combine anti-ship cruise missiles. Uncrewed surface vessels and land attack missiles such as Storm Shadow into a layered anti-access area denial threat. That has partially forced the Russian Navy out of Sevastopol raises important questions regarding the risks which surface vessels face, particularly in confined waters. The proliferation of these capabilities, many of which are now employed by weaker states and indeed non-state actors, will mean that what would have been largely uncontested deployments at sea in the past will involve contested theater entry. However, claims regarding the risk to surface combatants themselves should be scrutinized. In the Black Sea, despite high losses in aggregate, the Russian fleet has not endured a historically high loss rate. Over the course of the two-and-a-half-year conflict, Russia has lost 22 vessels, which amounts to a loss rate of 0.03 per 100 ship days in theater. For reference, the US loss rate against Japanese kamikazes off Okinawa was roughly 0.2 per 100 ship days with vessels sustaining damaging hits at a rate of 0.44 per 100 ship days and the UK task force in the Falklands endured 1.35 damaging hits per 100 ship days, despite which both navies prevailed. In effect, then, it is not clear that the vulnerability of vessels to the anti-access threats of yesteryear, be they crewed suicide aircraft or exocet missiles, was less acute than is the case now. The importance of not overstating the risks to surface vessels has been reinforced in the Red Sea where the Houthis have thus far failed to successfully engage a coalition surface combatant, and where UK and US vessels have enjoyed tactical successes against complex salvos incorporating capabilities such as C-802 anti-ship missiles, SAMAD-3 UAVs and ASIF anti-ship ballistic missiles. While in both the Black Sea and the Red Sea large surface combatants have been relatively safe, the same cannot be said for less heavily armed vessels and the fixed infrastructure that supports the fleet. Many of Ukraine's successes have been achieved against platforms, such as the Ropucha-class landing ship which serves as a logistical workhorse for the Russian army as well as minesweepers and patrol boats. In the Red Sea, the Houthis have enjoyed a comparatively high hit rate against merchant shipping. While warships themselves may not be more vulnerable, the threat that anti-access systems pose will be most acute for the lightly armed or unarmed oilers and solid support vessels that enable the Royal Navy's operations. The effect of this will be significant when limited numbers of support vessels are available. Additionally, while tasks such as mine countermeasures have always had to be conducted under some risk of an air threat, the UK's Royal Fleet Auxiliary Operated Mine Countermeasures vessels will face an increasingly multi-layered anti-access challenge incentivizing uncrewed solutions which can be employed from greater distances and multiple vessel types. Fixed infrastructure has also proven vulnerable even under optimal conditions. The ability of Ukraine's armed forces to progressively target both vessels and structures in Sevastopol, which is defended by a robust integrated air defense system, illustrates that over time even relatively well-defended fixed bastions will be challenged by crews and ballistic missiles, among other threats. For the UK, home ports such as Portsmouth are relatively safe. In the absence of a Russian intermediate-range ballistic threat, the primary threat is posed by cruise missiles, which if launched from the eastern flank would have to traverse a considerable amount of territory. That said, 
Key seaports of disembarkation on which elements of the Royal Navy and the wider UK joint force would depend in an expeditionary context are far more vulnerable by dint of proximity to likely theatres of combat. Examples include Duckham in Oman and Gothenburg in Sweden. The latter, as Scandinavia's largest port, has been an important logistical linchpin of exercises such as Trident Juncture, which included the Royal Navy and Marines. The challenge is not that sinking the Russian surface fleet will be inherently difficult, but rather that if the fleet opts to launch cruise missiles against civilian infrastructure from positions close to air defense networks in Kaliningrad and the Northern Bastion, there will be a political demand to engage it irrespective of the military value of doing so and the task will be a burden in terms of both planning and munitions expended. Given the likely demand for standoff munitions elsewhere in the theater, this is of importance. Surface strike, then, is a priority line of effort even if the Russian surface fleet is a decrepit force. The requirement to engage targets within well-defended bastions while accounting for limited VLS capacity into the 2030s. Even after vessels such as the Type 26 and Type 31 enter service. Will make it of particular importance that weapons such as FCASW are able to achieve a high single-shot probability of kill in defended airspace. Since the smaller a salvo, the more important penetration and successful engagement becomes. Though Russia's nuclear-powered submarines are its most potent capability, the Russian naval threat is not just a submarine threat. The conflicts in the Red Sea and Black Sea carry a number of important lessons which might inform the Royal Navy's efforts to generate its future fleet. In many ways, the technological dimensions of these conflicts though the most heavily studied have been less important than the fundamental lessons that they carry regarding how a fleet must structure and prioritize tasks to prepare for major contingencies. The lessons learned from these conflicts, then, have an evolutionary quality where many of the challenges of greatest significance relate to generating the capacity to leverage existing capabilities and competencies effectively. Technology can be an important enabler in this regard, but is not a solution in itself.